Good morning. Well, um, thank you very much for trudging through the rain to get here. Um, it is absolutely, it's like the end of the world out there. Um, anyway, uh, so today we are, uh, well, we're nearly there. We're shaping up to um, uh, come back next time to um, modes of presentation and formative identities and finally sort out these problems, well, revisit these problems with which we began. Um, I had meant to bring uh, the study questions for the final exam with me today. I could not get my printer to work. Um, so uh, immediately after the class, I will email the study questions for the final to everyone. Is, is that all right? If anyone needs a, a printed copy or can't access email or something, then l let me know. But they sh it should be with you by 20 minutes after the lecture. Okay. Okay, and if there are any questions, we can discuss that on Friday. Okay. Is that okay, Rodney? Okay. Okay, so looking at Russell um, on knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. So um, here's an old friend. You remember? Remember Twin Earth? Twin Earth, dear old Twin Earth. Um, happy days, happy days. Um, Twin Earth, you remember, is very much like Earth, um, except that uh, the stuff that fills the rivers and lakes um, on Twin Earth is not H2O, but XYZ. And the general model of these Twin Earth cases was something like, you can distinguish between the inside the head element that's in common between you and your double on Earth and on Twin Earth, and something about the causal or contextual surround that you have. Does that make sense? So that you on Earth and your double on Twin Earth are molecule for molecule identical. Um, so what's inside your head is just the same. But so when you say water, you mean something different to what your counterpart in Twin Earth means, and that must be because of something outside the head, the fact that you're causally connected to water, so, so, something like that. So you can separate the two aspects of meaning, um, the inside the head element that isn't enough for understanding or meaning, because it's in common between two people who have quite different meanings for the words they're using, and the stuff that's outside the head, which when you put the two together, you get understanding and meaning. Does that ring a bell? Is that? Yeah, that, that, that was the analysis. And I remember um, uh, we, we, we talked about quite a bit about this, the inside the head part and the causal contextual factor in virtue of which what's inside your head is representing something. And um, there, were, there was a question that someone raised in office hours uh, back then that really struck me very much. Um, they said, uh, what is really puzzling discussing this is whether the stuff that's causal or contextual, whether that's in your mind or not. Um, the question was, is that causal or contextual factor something that's in your mind? Because on the one hand, it seems like it should be, because it's something that is constitutively affecting which thoughts you're having. If you have something different inside you, uh, some different causal or contextual um, uh, surrounding, then you'd be having different thoughts. Uh, and your thoughts are presumably in your mind. But on the other hand, uh, when you think in terms of causal chains that may go back into history, it seems like the causal or contextual factor is something outside the mind, something external to the mind, something you wouldn't get any knowledge of just by looking inside your mind. Um, and I remember say, at the time saying uh, something helpful like, um, that's a difficult question and each must find his own way. Um, <laughs> but but I, I want to start out by suggesting that there's a way of seeing how to make a little bit of progress with that. Um, it comes when you think about what happened when we were discussing Wittgenstein and meaning and use and so, uh, uh, truth conditions and use and so on. 
Remember, the point when we were discussing Wittgenstein was that you could accept Wittgenstein's point that the use that we make of a term is fundamental, um, but still think that there's a role for reference and truth conditions um, in an account of our understanding of a term. You could think that knowledge of what has to be so for a sentence to be true, that's your knowledge of what you're about, what you're doing when you're using a sentence, what the point is of using that sentence the way you do. Um, so, it isn't, Wittgenstein seems to say, there is only the use. We just operate with inputs and outputs from the environment, from other people um, in using language, and that's all that's going on. But what this discussion about tonk and so on, the, the point of that discussion was to suggest there's more to it than that. With tonk, what's going wrong is not just that there's something strange about the pattern of inputs and outputs, is that you have no idea what you're about in using the sign the way you do. So that reference, Wittgenstein's arguing that the use isn't something that's derived from the reference of the sign. The pattern of inputs and outputs to your sign isn't something that's generated by what it stands for or its truth conditions or its semantic value. Um, and the thing is, so long as you were thinking of the pattern of use that was made of the term as something that was driven by something that was made to happen by the, the reference of the term, then it's hard to see why those causal or contextual factors should be thought of as inside the mind. If what's going on is that you've got uh, a person here, you've got Oscar here, um, with this pattern of inputs and outputs to, from their use of terms, and then you've got causal or contextual factors, say from the water outside or the people outside, causing them to make those patterns of use of the terms, then this stuff out here, the causal or contextual stuff, the stuff that fixes reference, is difficult to see why that should itself be thought of as something that's inside the mind. That's when it's puzzling to think, is the causal or contextual factor something inside the mind? But what I was suggesting was, Wittgenstein is attacking that idea that knowledge of the use of the term is derived from knowledge of the reference. We have to forget that, the path that, that idea of something coming from outside and making this stuff happen. The use that you make of the term is fundamental. That was the thing about the bit in the middle that keeps blinking out. Yes, the bit in the middle, yeah, okay. Um, uh, so we take the use of the term as fundamental, but we need knowledge of reference to make it intelligible to us what we're doing, why there's some point to this when we're doing these inputs and outputs the way we do. So suppose we acknowledge Wittgenstein's point that use is more fundamental than knowledge of truth conditions, but we keep a role for reference and truth conditions in making use intelligible. Then, if your knowledge of what the sign stands for is going to be what lets you know what you're about in using the sign, um, then it seems much more important that your knowledge of the reference of the term, that what's supplied by the causal or contextual factor, that has to be something that's inside the mind. If it's going to be, if your knowledge of reference, which is what the causal or contextual factor supplies, if that's going to be something that makes it intelligible to you what you're about in using the sign, then um, that uh, thing that's making it intelligible to you what you're about in using the sign has got to be something that's inside your mind. It mustn't be something that's just an external driver of the pattern of use. It's something that you have cognitive access to that um, makes your practice intelligible. And I'm going to suggest today that um, in the most basic cases, you've, your knowledge of the reference of the terms you're using 
is provided by your awareness of the objects you're talking about, by your experience of your, the objects you're talking about, by your consciousness of the objects you're talking about. This is pretty abstract, um, but um, I'll give some examples in a moment. But I wanted to tie this back to this thing of the causal or contextual factor in the twin earth cases and what's inside the head and what's outside the head. Put up your hand if the situation is that this is pretty abstract, but you, you think you've more or less got it, but you wouldn't mind seeing an example. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, um, suppose we uh, think about um, Pelician's thing last time. Pelician's thing last time, where you're doing the multi. You, you don't have to do any more of this multiple object tracking, but you remember the multiple object tracking, where Pelician said the most basic kind of reference you've got is the reference you have in perception when you just tag a thing so that you can interrogate the scene to find out more about it. So you're keeping tabs on these moving objects using visual indexes and inside your brain is some system like this that lets you, once you've tagged an object, interrogate the scene to get more information about it so that if you're just looking around the room and your eye falls on a particular person, then you can interrogate the scene to get more information about them. Um, and you can think of this as uh, one way, Pollution thinks of this as one way of explaining Russell's notion of acquaintance. Um, the idea is that out there is the object, the other person or whatever it is, that causes this cognitive system to come into play with the visual index. That's the root of reference, that external causal connection between the object and the cognitive system in your brain. Now, on this kind of picture, on Pollution's kind of picture, there's no role for you, the fact that you're conscious of the world. That you have experience of the object you're looking at, that is really just an accident. It, it isn't a working part of the system. And this cognitive system here has to be input to your thinking. It has to be input to your general thinking. And of course, in fact, ordinarily, when you look around the room and you think about one person now about another, then um, uh, you will have experience of them. But experience is just being, how should I say, given off like a waste gas. It's just a kind of byproduct of the functioning of the system here. It, it isn't a working part of the machinery of how you manage to think about the things around you. So in principle, you could do without the consciousness here. I think this is a, a fairly standard picture nowadays of how reference works. Um, and the thing about it is that consciousness of your ex environment becomes dispensable from an account of how you were able to think about the things around you. So even if you didn't have any sensory awareness of all the people around you right now, you could still think about each of them in just the same way as you do now. You could do it without the waste gas. Um, in principle, you could have pollution's kind of causal contact with the object even if you had no experience of it. One way to think of this is, um, have you guys come across blind sight? Put up your hand if you've heard of blind sight. Okay, about, about, about half. Okay. Well, blind sight happens when um, someone gets a bash on the head. I mean, the classical cases happen as a result of injury. You get a bash in the head at the back, and um, half of the, the, the visual signals come from the eye, go right to the back of the head, and then they're sent up and down for more processing. So what happens is someone gets a bash, a result of which they have no experience in, say, the left side of their visual field. Right? So for this person, there's nothing in the left side of their visual field, no experience at all. And you say to such a person, well, what's in the left side of your visual field? And they say, well, <laughs> I can't see a thing. And you say, well, is it upright or is it tilted? And they say, let me just repeat that. I can't see a thing in the left side of my visual field. 
And you say to them, well, go on, guess. Is it upright or tilted? And they guess, and they reliably get it right. Um, uh, characteristically to their own astonishment. I mean, these people have the daylights tested out of them. You know, they, <laughs> they spend their lives being tested, so they're less surprised after a bit. But initially, it's extremely surprising. The way it would be for you or me, if, you were, if it turned out, you could accurately guess what was going on behind your head without having to look. Um, so here is um, a graphic illustration. Um, the patient's looking at the screen with uh, stripes on it, saying, but I'm blind there, I can't see any stripes. And the experimenter says, well, have a guess. Well then, I guess I see horizontal red stripes. And the patient is reliably correct. Now, what's going on, I mean, yeah? Yes, yeah, good. Sorry? The eye that can see is closed, right? The eye that can see is closed. No, neither I can see. Or oh. It's the left half of the whole visual field, the visual field of the two eyes. Oh. Uh, you, you see what I mean? Yeah, it's not just one eye that's been taken out. Um, it's quite a deep injury yeah, uh, 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 in the visual system. Um, any, any other questions about what the scenario is there? So, um, There's quite a lot patients, it turns out, can guess correctly about what's in the blind field. Um, and I, I'm not aware of anything having been done specifically on multiple object tracking. I mean, they do lots of tests, but it is astonishing just how much patients reliably get right. You can tell a patient to reach for what's in the blind field and they will shape their hand correctly to get the size and um, shape of the thing. You can ask them to guess about the emotional expression of a face in the blind field, and they will get that right. And from an engineering point of view, it's not that there's anything mysterious about this. You just have, um, uh, you have, <laughs> I mean, never write this down, but my the, the, the physiology is something like this. You have something like, see, if this is the eye, you have signals going from the eye to the uh, back of the head, um, and then uh, uh, going off in two visual pathways. Um, and what happens is that one pathway is the one that uh, subserves conscious experience. So down here, you have conscious experience of the scene. That's the circuitry that supports conscious experience. Up here, you have another pathway that is supporting action on the objects in the scene. And um, that what's happening is that this one's been taken out in that half of the blind field by damage, and uh, this one is still functioning, um, it's still getting a lot of input, it's still uh, functionally intact. Um, so the patient can move, reach, make guesses correctly um, uh, without the benefit of conscious experience. So physiologically, I don't think there's any great mystery here. Um, but the question is, suppose you can do that. Suppose you have something um, in your blind field, and suppose you're completely correct. So suppose you have a vast volume of information about it. You can guess. Uh, I guess it's a piece of chalk. I guess it's white. I guess it's upright. Um, you can do all that stuff. Are you then in a position to refer to the object? You've got the causal connection but you don't have experience of the thing, is that enough for reference? Well, it seems to me, if you think about this in Wittgensteinian terms, that what the patient's got there is they can use the sign. They can get the inputs and outputs right. Um, they could talk pretty much like a regular person um, using a sign like that thing, that piece of chalk. But, yep. Reading in the blind field. I've, I've never heard of anyone uh, raising that question about reading in the blind. I mean, not every answer is known, if you see what I mean. And even all the answers that are known aren't always known by me. Um, but <laughs> but I, I don't know of anything about reading in the blind field. Um, it would really be astonishing uh, if there's anything like that. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um,
But, I mean, what the hell, for our purposes, we're philosophers, um, we can suppose, I mean, it, it's, there's no contradiction in the idea that circuitry adequate for reading could be left in the blind field. But they wouldn't understand what they're reading. But, you, but well, you, you wouldn't have any awareness of what you were reading. You know that you, you, if, you, if you're an ordinary language speaker, you might find yourself guessing that the words were thus and so. I know what such words meant. It's just that you wouldn't have any sensory awareness of the words on the page. Yeah. Um, so it seems to make... <laughs> that's a really portentous noise. <laughs> it seems to make perfect sense, I think, to suppose that you could subtract conscious experience but leave intact the ability to use the sign. But still it seems like when the patient is doing this, guessing about what's in the blind field, guessing what's going on in there, um, there is still something they're going to learn when this comes into view, when they do get experience of it. The patient learns something at that point, and what they learn is which thing they were talking about. I mean, intuitively, if you don't have sensory experience, you don't know what you're talking about. You like someone using a sign like tonk or star, um, where you've got a pattern of use for it all right, but you don't have the knowledge of reference that would make it intelligible to you what you're doing with this sign. So it seems to me in, that, in those blind sight kind of cases, um, the patient doesn't know what the sign stands for. It's your sensory experience of the objects around you that provides you with knowledge of reference. So it seems to me you wouldn't be able to think about the other people in the room in just the same way if you subtracted sensory experience. Sensory experience is really not like a kind of waste gas being given off. It only seems like that if you say the only real thing here is the use and you forget about knowledge of reference and knowledge of truth conditions, the thing that m makes it intelligible to you, what your objective is in using language. Let me give um, just one other example. Suppose that you and I are sitting side by side in a crowded room. So suppose you and I are sitting over there and um, uh, you say, um, look at that woman over there and um, I say, well, who, which one, what are you talking about? And I, I don't know who you mean, I say. And you say, well, um, guess what she's wearing. Um, and I say, but I've no idea who you're talking about. And I say, well, I guess it's something red. And it turns out I'm right. And you say, guess where they're from. And I say, but I've no idea. And I guess, and again, I'm right. Right. Now, that really could happen. There's no, there's no contradiction in that. Um, you say, try to point to them. And I, all right. <laughs> and I do, I get it right. Um, in that case, what I'd say is, I'm getting all this right. I'm using the sign. I have the Wittgensteinian use of the sign, that woman, um, pretty well. But I have no idea who I'm talking about. I only know who we're talking about when I finally focus and I get it, oh, it's that one, and I now manage to single them out in my experience. What I say is, I didn't know who we were talking about until I got that experience of them. So it seems to me in that kind of case, that, that's a simpler case than a blindside case. You know, it doesn't involve supposing I don't have any sensory experience. It's just that I'm not able yet to hook up my sensory experience to our conversation. And it seems to me I can't be said to know who you're referring to until I'm conscious of the person. Yeah. So for something like Aristotle, I've never actually seen Aristotle. So. Uh -huh. Uh, I would have to say that you do know who you're talking, you can still know who you're talking about uh, when you talk about Aristotle without um, uh, having sensory experience of Aristotle. That would be too, too demanding. 
Um, it's one thing to say that, s that sensory experience plays a role in this kind of case, where you're discussing an ordinary conversation about things right in front of you, using terms like that tree or that man or, or, or whatever. Um, it would be a different thing to say all singular reference is like that. Yeah. Um, so what I'm suggesting is there are cases that, are, and I think these are basic class of cases, where you can use terms to refer to objects you currently perceive, and there that's happening in virtue of sensory experience. But there's a whole further class of cases of objects that you know about from literature, or objects that you know about from other people telling you, um, or from memory, that are not like that, and they need separate discussion. Yeah. Uh, my point is only, in this special kind of case, there is work for sensory experience to do. Not that it always has to do that work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, if they're not just, I mean, born blind is one thing and having no sensory experience at all is another, yeah. Suppose you have someone born in a sensory deprivation tank, yeah, then, they, then it follows from what I'm saying, they are never going to be able to refer to anything. Yeah, I think that's right. If this is a basic case, the perceptual case, as, as I'm suggesting, and, um, um, the basic case requires sensory experience, then if you don't have sensory experience of anything ever, then you're not going to be able to think about anything ever. Um, and that's, I think that's the right answer. Is, it, is that right? I mean... Well, like someone on a blind side has code names, um, like Jeff Bezos, and at one point they weren't blind, right? Like someone who was born blind couldn't be I think, yeah, that, that's a great question. You could have, so, yeah. So suppose, I said a sensory deprivation tank, but suppose someone born in a tank that provides them with no experience of their surroundings, but allows them to make correct, reliably correct guesses as to what's going on in their surroundings, yeah? And they just use the words in the right way. Um, I think you're then going to have, I mean, that, that's the kind of situation you have if you have a robot uh, yeah, where well, you have a robot that has no sensory experience of anything that's going on around it, but um, can nonetheless turn out the right phrases to say um, that's someone wearing a hat or, 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 or whatever can do that stuff. And what you wonder is, is it thinking? Is that expressing genuine thoughts about what's around it? And what I'm suggesting is that wouldn't be expressing genuine thoughts because it wouldn't be grounded in sensory experience. You have, so far as the use goes, a facsimile of an ordinary human being. And you have everything that Wittgenstein looks for in understanding. But that just shows what Wittgenstein missed out, namely the importance of sensory experience, in giving you this knowledge of reference that lets you know what's going on when you're speaking and thinking. Who it is, what it is that you're speaking and thinking about. Okay. Okay, so I think um, um, if you look at Russell's discussion um, of knowledge by description and knowledge by acquaintance, there is such a thing as um, being able to pick out someone just by a description. Um, Aristotle might be one case like that, the last great philosopher of antiquity. Or even the blind sight patient can say, whatever it is, can have a description like, whatever it is in my blind field that the experimenter is pointing to. Um, then uh, you can frame these descriptions all right. Um, you can frame a description like, the first headache I will have in 2013. Will it be a sharp pulsating headache? Or will it be one of those dull, heavy, heavy ones? You can speculate like that, yeah? Will it have been caused by Wittgenstein? Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you, I mean, it makes perfect sense. But Russell's contrasting that way of uh, specifying a thing, the first edict I'll have in 2013, 
with simple reference like this headache or this pain. Yeah. And remember, there was, uh, I won't go over it here, but there was that argument that um, these are basically uh, quantifier expressions. And wherever you've got quantifier expressions, how many expressions, you've got to have them grounded in the use of simple names. Does that, that ring a bell? Okay. Then, um, when you've got that use of simple names, I think when you look at what Russell is saying, Russell is saying that use of simple names always involves experience of the object. It's not quite like, I mean, Pollution offers his account as a way of saying what acquaintance means. But I think if you look at what Russell means by acquaintance, it always has to do with your consciousness of the object you're talking about. Um, I'm acquainted with an object when I have a direct cognitive relation to the thing, i.e. when I am directly aware of the object itself. So Russell was trying to pin down this really basic class of uh, referring devices that are the foundation of all other reference. And um, uh, that's a direct awareness of the object. And he said the word acquaintance is designed to emphasize the relational character of the fact with which we're concerned. Um, it's not that your mind, is, if your mind is over here, and the object is over here, then it is not that your mind is forming a representation that represents that object. It's the awareness is a relation between your mind and the object, in virtue of which you can represent it. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a little bit complicated in Russell's case, because the objects are sense data, which are not strictly um, they're not really external, they're not ordinary physical objects. They are, as it were, outside the mind, but only just outside. Right? They're just a little way outside the mind, so that you can be related to them by this relation of acquaintance. So it's not a type of representation. And you might think, it's like that just in ordinary perceptual experience. That if you experience someone else, if someone else is in your visual field, if uh, you attend to someone you can see, then that's a relation between you and that person. That's not basically a matter of you representing them. It's what makes it possible for you to represent them. We'll say we have acquaintance with anything of which we're directly aware without the intermediary of any process of inference or any knowledge of truth. And then he says, when we ask what are the kinds of objects with which we're acquainted, the first and most obvious example is sense data, your headache, your sensation of red. You can talk about them because they're just outside your mind, but you're certainly having awareness of them. When I see a color or hear a noise, I have direct acquaintance with the color or the noise. In addition to awareness of particulars, we also have, though not, not in quite the same sense, awareness of universals. Not only are we aware of particular yellows, but if we have seen a sufficient number of yellows and have sufficient intelligence, we are aware of the universal yellow. So when Wittgenstein was saying what happens is you go, this is yellow, this is yellow, this is yellow, this is yellow, and the person you're trying to teach the meaning of yellow, after a bit, they go yellow, 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 too. Then that picture of Wittgenstein's is a picture that doesn't give any role to sensory experience in your understanding of what yellow is. Someone born blind who had neural circuitry that would allow them to say, that's yellow, that's yellow, that's yellow, and that, that isn't, they would, know, they would understand the word yellow perfectly well on Wittgenstein's picture. But Russell's here is saying that's not right. For in order to know what yellow is, you need sensory experience of yellowness. And the reason you need it is not to tell you which particular things are yellow. Because after all, a robot could have that. A robot could have um, a light meter that was differentially sensitive to yellowness um, without 
having any experience of yellowness. A human could have circuitry that would let them be differentially sensitive to the yellow things without having any experience of yellowness. But if you never had any experience of yellowness, you wouldn't know what the thing is. You wouldn't know what the colors are if it weren't for your experience of them. And Russell is saying here, that's what's the key thing for knowing what the term stands for. Seeing a sufficient number and thereby becoming aware of the universal yellow. And then that universal becomes the subject in judgments like yellow differs from blue or yellow resembles blue less than green does. So just as with that man or that woman, it's your sensory experience of the object that allows you to think about it. So too, with the color yellow, it's your sensory experience of the thing that allows you to think about it. And the universal yellow is a predicate in judgments like this is yellow, where this is a particular sense datum. So the real sticking point in Russell is this, when he says, among the objects with which we're acquainted are not included physical objects as opposed to sense data, nor other people's minds. That what's, that's what leaves us all shut away behind our own sense data uh, uh, w w without any possibility of real communication with other people. That's what I want to do on Friday is try to see how we get over this and liberate this talk about sensory experience as acquaintance with, from Russell's restriction to um, uh, sense data uh, and how we can address these problems about informative identities and meaning without reference um, that are what drove Russell to this position. He talks about physical objects and other people being known by knowledge by description. And we have merely descriptive knowledge when we say, we know that the thing exists, uh, we know that the so-and-so exists, then even if we're acquainted with the fact that the so-and-so, we don't know any proposition of the form, A is the so-and-so, where A is something with which we're acquainted. And with that example of you and I sitting there and you talking about that woman and I making my guesses, then I can say um, th there's that woman that my friend is, refer that is referring to, there's that woman that I'm causally responsive to, but I'm not in a position to know anything of that form. A is the so-and-so, where A is something with which I'm acquainted. But it's that knowledge provided by extensory experience that's the foundation of uh, all other reference. That's what I'm going to try and tape down next time. Yes? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean to be talking about robots in such a way that uh, I'm kind of taking you for granted that robots don't have sensory experience. And of course you can give a robot a sensor. Yeah. But does it feel pain? Does it have the sensation of yellowness? Uh, that, that's what I'm assuming it doesn't have. Yeah. What you could easily do is make a robot that has some kind of sensor that allows to discriminate yellowness. Okay. Are you, are you, but you're not suggesting that having conscious experience would be an easy thing to do with a robot? No. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. Um, you do need to have so much more. And that's what I mean to, I, I mean, it's, I, I don't for a moment think that Wittgenstein was um, uh, just making a mistake. Yeah. Um, there is the whole pattern of use of the term. Um, th that whole ability 
to respond and say, this is yellow, that's yellow, uh, to talk about yellowness, to say, what a sumptuous yellow. Uh, uh, um, to, uh, yeah, um, that is an egg-colored yellow, so, so, something like that. Um, you, you could, there is all that, a creamy yellow. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting that just having a presentation of yellow things allows you to do that. An animal could have that, a sensory presentation of yellow things, and just have no idea what to do with it. Yeah. So the whole pattern of use is something that can't be derived from the sensory experience. Yeah. But what I was suggesting with Tonk was that um, with the logical constants, with logical signs like and and or and all that, you can't derive their use from knowledge of truth conditions, but still you need the truth table to give you some idea of what you're doing in using this sign. And I'm suggesting that for reference generally, it's, not, it's, it's kind of like the truth table. It's not that just getting the scene in front of you and you can say, well, now you know how to go on. Now you know how to continue the series. That's not the way it works. But neither is it the case that if you just drill a robot or just drill a human in such a way that they can go on, that's enough for understanding. Sensory experience comes in as providing you with your knowledge of what you're doing when you engage that skill. Uh, is that addressing what you said at all? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. Can you uh, explain the diagram that you're on the board when you're talking about the relational? Okay. Uh, yeah. R Russell's picture is that acquaintance is the relation that makes representation possible. So if I'm going to talk about this headache, there has to be the headache and my having experience of it. Yeah? So experience of the headache is not itself the same thing as representing the headache. It's something more basic. than the, And when Russell's talking about sense data generally, like a sensation of red, when you say this sensation of red is very evocative or whatever, then um, the idea is here is the sensation of red. You are related to it by acquaintance. And in virtue of that, you can represent it. You're related to the red? To the red sensation, the yeah, red sensation. by acquaintance. And in virtue of that, you can think about it. Yep. So the, the basic point there was that acquaintance is more basic than representation. Somehow wh when you're thinking about um, perception, it's very natural to think that perception just involves representing everything in the room around you. But what I was suggesting in cases like that woman, in, in that case where I'm just guessing, um, it's uh, um, what makes it not guessing when I finally get a good look at the person and I manage to single them out visually, um, that's what's making it possible for me now to think about that person. And so it's more basic than thought. Is that sensory relation to the thing? Yeah. yeah. So are, are you denying that like, a perception is a representation? Or? Um, I'm denying that the sensory experience should be thought of as a representation. Yeah. So even like a visual sensation is not a representation? That's right. It's more basic than that. Because the sensory experience is what's making representation possible. So the line of thought here is exactly the same as Russell's when he says, um, the word acquaintance is designed to emphasize the relational fact with which you are concerned. Um, is not a type of representation. Yeah. So I, I'm just using that same argument. Since sensory experience is the platform on which your ability to represent the world is built, um, that platform itself can't consist in a whole bunch of representations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, so if I see a red ball today and 
Yeah. 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 He says it, it's not the case that what we have in our head is representation. So when I'm speaking of the red ball tomorrow, yep. what am I referring to? Like in my, it's obviously not in front of me because I can't refer to the object directly. So what right. am I referring to if not a representation? Well, what? <laughs> Fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> what Russell says is, uh, when you think of the the um, uh, relation of acquaintance, yeah, it's natural to think that the relation of acquaintance holds only between you and a sensation or something that is there right now. Yeah, but uh, when you think about memory, um, I particularly say memory of something that happened just five minutes ago. Yeah, uh, say someone looked in the door. And <laughs> I'm not trying to make everyone look at the door. <laughs> but, but say someone looked in the door, and um, then a few minutes later you think, who was that? Yeah. Then the idea is you can have a sensory experience. If this is time, um, you can have, you now can have acquaintance with a sensation or, or an item that was distant in time, that was not present. Um, Russell says uh, the memory, the, the act of remembering here straddles the time series and can be assigned no definite temporal location. But surely at some point your memory starts to deteriorate, right? I try to remember something from when I was five years old. I may still yeah. have this relation to it, but my memory may be faulty. Your memory may be faulty, but um, uh, suppose it's not. Um, I mean, I, I don't mean to cheat you, but um, suppose you, you are in the good case. Yeah, there it is, clear. Dear old spot, right? You, you, you remember dear old spot, right? And dear old spot comes right before your mind. And then the picture is, when that's happening, you are acquainted with spot through memory. It's not of the thing itself. So, it, 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 did you say it is or of the thing itself? Like yeah, it's of the thing itself. You said the sense datum or whatever. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I actually think this is quite intuitive when you think about it. That um, if you think, if you suddenly find yourself, um, you eat a piece of cake, and suddenly there's spot live before your memory. You remember those happy days with spot in the firelight. The family sitting around, um, yeah, um, <laughs> all those winter's evenings, um, uh, dear old spot watching the game of dominoes. Um, then uh, uh, your experiential connect with the past there to the past object, that is what's straddling the time series, and that's what allows you now to think about what was going on then is because it's just like the case of suddenly identifying which person in the crowd it is that your other person is talking about. Getting that lock onto the individual, that sensory experience of the individual, is what lets you think about them. And similarly in that memory case, if you're talking to me about spot, if you're saying, do you remember dear old spot? And then I suddenly get it. When I, that moment when I say, aha, now I remember. That's what allows me now to take an intelligent part in the conversation and communicate about spot. Okay, more next time. Th thank you again for trudging through the rain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>